Good afternoon from Africa. Good afternoon from Nigeria. We are streaming from Ibadan. In all your state, the program is State Affairs. I am Edmond Dupilo. Welcome to the class of history, politics, and power. On Monday, I discussed self-determination. I defined what a nation is. And I promised to continue that analysis. On this edition of the program, the analysis will continue, but from a different dimension. This time, we want to look at personalities, events in the history of Nigeria that define Nigeria's nationhood. In this case, we will be looking at the man who set the agenda for national politics in Nigeria. The man who murdered the Nigerian constitution. They are also the men who established the political value system of Nigeria. So by and large, we are looking at the Nigerian nationalist triad, Amadou Bello, Namdi Azikiwe, and Obafemi Awolowom. The theme, the theme of this class is taken from chapter 9 of the book Decolonizing Nigeria 1945 to 1960 Politics, Power and Personalities A book written by Professor Tony Falola and Dr. Bola Dauda. Look at the book. This is the book I'm talking about. You see it? Decolonizing Nigeria, 1945 to 1960. It talks about power, politics, and personalities. It's a big book, a comprehensive history of the Nigerian state, 612 pages, written by renowned scholars of Nigerian history, politics, and power. So one of the authors of the book is my guest on this edition of the program. He is Dr. Bola Dauda. Dr. Dauda, it's good to have you on State Affairs. Thank you. And I must thank you for writing this book. It's a pleasure. When you read the book, how do you feel? Oh, how do I feel? How do you mean? How do I feel? Writing it, it or... Reading it. Reading it. Yes. Well, it's reading Nigeria. And from how it all started to where we are today. So anyone who wants to understand the politics of Nigeria, the political culture of Nigeria, and how everything all started mm. um, from the time the British came in to where we are today, we find the book quite instructive educating, and will help to understand why things are so difficult to fix in Nigeria today. You know, the book is permanently on my reading table because it, I, I constantly refer to it. So often, I am flipping through the pages to say, okay, so this is where we are coming from. Yes. And from the past... 
I can see why we are where we are. Now, this chapter, chapter 9 of the book, you started by quoting Obafemi Awolo. Yes. I want to read. You said, I do not hesitate to confess. That's Awolo now. Yes. I do not hesitate to confess that I owe my success in life to three factors. The grace of God, a Spartan self-discipline, and a good wife. Yes. From your research, what do I mean by Spartan self-discipline? Yes, that is interesting because when I was in school in the early 60s, the motto for the school or what we used to is we call ourselves the Spartans. And from the Spartan history, you know, a Spartan dies but never uh, surrendered. So they were disciplined, they were determined, they were ready to die for whatever they believed in. So the Spartan is um, a, a, a good starting point to how people achieve what they achieve. So yes, the Spartans die, they never surrender. Did Awolowo surrender? I don't think he did. What about Namdi Azikiwe? Namdi Azikiwe came from a different background. Don't forget that Namdi Azikiwe um, was self-made in a way. Um, he was a boxer. <laughs> mm. And um, there was a time he even thought of committing suicide in the U.S., you know. So it was uh, quite a hard life. So, but he mm. was influenced by the American culture, political culture and social culture. So, and his Igbo background as well. So uh, they were two different personalities. So how do you define Amadou Bello? in their midst. Actually, understanding the Nigerian politics required going back to the early uh, time, 1900, when the country was taken over. So at that point in time, Britain, United Kingdom today, exported the politics of United Kingdom to Nigeria by sending L Lord Lugat to the north who was also personified by Amadou Bello in terms of um, uh, aristocratic background, in terms of the beliefs, and so on. And then you have Magrigo, you know, a Scottish person sent to uh, Lagos. Mm. And then you have more from Wales sent to the rest of the Southern Protectorate. So you had the, the, the British politics brought into Nigeria, and it was as if they selected the same personalities in the three core Nigerian ethnic group as the colonial masters. Now, now that you have taken us to Lugard, let's read from your book. Here you were quoting Dame Magri Panham, who said in her biography of Lord Lugard, there was a gloomy feeling that Britain, in its deal to take over Nigeria, was being let in for a bad bargain. You said, consequently, as Nicholson noted, the main difficulties in the amalgamation of the North and South Protectorate could be traced back to Lugard's own achievements in the north. There, instead of administering things and developing services, Lugard had been preoccupied with the widespread extension of rule over the people, an undertaking so unprofitable that he made amalgamation of the viable south and the bankrupt north both far more urgent from the point of view of the home government. I'm interested in this point. Bankrupt North 
Vibe South. Yes. How? <laughs> it's interesting that people don't learn from history. And it's also interesting that the Nigerian politics today, you know, still goes back to this issue of you have two separate countries, the North and the South, and if you like, the Lagos colony as a third factor, brought together by Lugard simply because of his political agenda. The North was not viable for Lugard because Lugard refused the Home Office from sending administrator to him. He actually made his brother, you know, he introduced nepotism at his worst level to Nigeria. So instead of allowing the Home Office to send an administrator, Lugard resisted it. So he could not raise revenue, he could not develop the place, he could not do anything to help the people. And that's what we are still suffering from today. Mm. That, that the North, you know, uh, was far behind. There was no one university graduate from Nigeria in 1950, from Northern Nigeria in 1950. And when his successor took over from him, he lamented that for 20 years of Lugas administration, there was no one qualified for the least job from the North. You're talking about Sir Clifford here. Yeah. He took over from Lugard. Lugard. And by the time he took over, there was no one from the North. So the whole problem or that we had about development started with Lord Lugard and the way he administered the Northern Nigeria before Northern Nigeria became uh, unprofitable and needed to bring the Southern Nigeria together so, to raise revenue to run the north. So the point you're making is the amalgamation was carried out so that the south, the viable south, would help the moribund north. Is that a point? Correct. You've also made a point that the north was a country on its own and the south a country on its own. In a way. The Northern Protectorate, the Southern Protectorate. Yes, and the Lagos Colony. And the Lagos Colony. Do you feel Lugard should not have amalgamated the protectorates? He had no choice because there was no way he could run the place without finance. And the only way he could do it was to bring it together. Unfortunately for him, he had people in power to help him he would not have even been qualified because he will, there was case against him for his activities in South Africa, you know, before he was taken to Nigeria. So, but Chamberlain and his other friend there, they presented to the house that he was the most qualified person. Mm. So, in the end, you, you, he had the day. You, you have talked about feudalism. Yes. Let's also read from your book. Historically, Falola and Auda writes, historically, England is a class-divided nation with bundles of contradiction and paradoxes. Yes. Of course, all nations have their share of contradictions. Yes. And paradoxes. All nations have classes, but England is in a class of its own. Yes. It is a nation of lords and royalists, as well as commoners. Yes. Of missionaries and mercenaries. Yes. Of philanthropists and extortionists. With its two party politics, it encompasses both conservatives and populists. Yes. Did England bring this its character to its colonies? Of course it did. How did that reflect on Nigeria? The way it reflected on Nigeria and continues to determine Nigeria's politics is the fact that some people 
for example, if you are born in, of working class in England, you die a working class. You can become a professor, you still feel yourself you are a working class. So that is how much the class is, you know, segregated in a way. But John Major was of the working class, as yeah. is stated here. Yes. But he became prime minister. He became prime minister, but he was never respected. What about Margaret Thatcher? He, yes. Also. From the working class. Working class. But she was respected. Uh, that is where individual comes in. Margaret Thatcher was the first woman prime minister. And, in fact, there used to be a saying that the only man in her cabinet was herself. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it meant that the others were just yes people sur surrounding her. And she was so powerful that there was no way uh, anyone could oppose what she wanted. So in that case, it's not class that defines character. Uh, it's always difficult to use words or to use logic to express some concepts. If you say it's not only class, yes, it's not only class, but class in, in England is very important. You and know, it's still very important. It's still very important. Yes. In this book, the point that Lugard's natural allies could only be the Aousa Fulani, whose ideals of control was conquest. How? How? How did Lugard fall in love with the North? Well, if you are coming from a social background and you are now in charge of a territory and you find allies who share the same feudal, the same aristocratic uh, background with you. It becomes easier for you to operate. For example, they could not trust Tawolawo. They could not even, they feared Tawolawo. But they knew Asikiwe was a different character. So in the end, it was very easy for Lugat to cooperate with the North. The other thing was that Lugat met a system in place that was already tax system for in the North. If you had so many cows or so many uh, sheep or so, there is so much that you pay. So the tax system was there. Islam was also there, which has its own uh, principles on taxation. So it was very easy for him to do what he did because the system uh, provided the background for, for, for it. Is that why Indaretru worked so well in the North? Yes, it did. It was an organized political system. It was. That I, worked. That worked. At that time, the political system in the North was complex and efficient. Yes. So can't we say that the North has the mastery of politics more than the South? Uh, you are <laughs> jumping the gun in terms of uh, thinking from it's like thinking backwards okay. from what is present you know in, in the language is anachronic uh, thinking mm -hmm. in which you what didn't exist at the time you are now superimposing the existing knowledge over what happened so the system in the north yes supported it but it doesn't mean that there weren't other areas in which the system also works in the rest of Nigeria. You know, on page 84 here, yes. the authors of the book alludes to the fact that Lugard's refusal to allow education in the North and his opposition to the general development of the Kunduli was an issue. Why do you think he refused to allow education in the North? <laughs> I, I always want us to go back to the history of England. The, the principle in England is that if you educate people, they start getting ideas. So they didn't even allow 
education. Britain didn't have education policy until about 1980s. It, it, I don't know whether it's exactly 81 or 82, but until 1980s. So they were they they had a system of using the class to support the aristocratic system. And the knot was constructed for that. It was just a template. I see. But they could not stop education in the South. Because of the personality in the South. Azikiwe and Awolowo. In a way, Awolowo. In a way, Awolowo. Yes. Why not Azikiwe? Azikiwe, when Awolowo was promoting education, especially basic education, primary, Azikiwe thought it was a yellow uh, journalism. It was just uh, looking for votes and didn't believe in it. But there was education in the East. It came later without any planning and it failed. But even the East even started building a university before the West. Uh, I don't know where what you are talking about. The University of Nigeria and Suka. Yes. Or Bafemi Awolowo University, then OAU. Yes. So the East built a university almost at the same time. Yes. That the West started its own. Yeah. Look look back at where we are we are we are looking at 1945 to 1960. Remember, Azikiwe went to the United States for education. Banu, GK, they were all in the U.S. schooling. Yes. Before independence. Yes. So the East and the West were in hot competition in terms of education. I don't know. The, what you are doing is reducing the facts mm. as if it was the cause of or it was meant. In 1951, mm -hmm. I will all set up a committee to look into how they could introduce basic education in the West, Western region. And they planned, he got Professor Igun, who was a statistician from UN or so, from America, to come and help to plan for the education. As if we didn't believe in it. Mm that it was possible. So from 1951 to 1954, 55, when education uh, took off, they planned for 150,000 children. And on day one, they had over 400,000 children. So it was after, in fact, Awolowo lost the election in the West in 1954, 55, because of his introduction of free education. And people like that supported him, Adelabu and so on, were saying, you know, that means when you send your children to school, who's going to help you to um, uh, sell your, uh, your goods? So basically, it was after the success of our free education in the West that Azikwe rushed to introduce it in the East, and it failed. And it failed. But as we speak today, yes, the East and the West are in hot competition when it comes to education, economy, and finance. How did the East attain that? Um, the Yoruba has a way of saying it, that you are looking at someone who has a crooked leg uh, and you are looking at the, the, the load that it wasn't properly uh, placed, mm. whereas it's the crooked leg that is affecting it. So the competition came later and it, it wasn't in the same way that it was done in the, in the West. And that is what caused the whole problem of the gap between the North and the South. Yes, our, in fact, Asikwe was responsible for the uh, great, about seven or nine people that were taken to the U.S. and became, you know, the big uh, promotion of the, the East. But in terms of education itself, when you look at how it was implemented, Awolowo did not set up a school in the West. The communities did. The uh, missionaries did. 
the Muslims catch up with it and started their own schools. Mm. So the play, the in terms of planning, the uh, Awolowo's plan for education was quite different from Asikwe's uh, planning for it. The communities in the east were sending their children abroad. But communities were also building schools in the east. If you yes. go to the east now, you have many community schools. Yes, now you are saying. But in terms of the way it all started, the planning was more mm. methodical, more realistic, and actually up to today, you can see the difference in terms of the way education was uh, run in the West. When we come to the personalities of this man, we will look at their character. Now let's look at this point here. We are discussing the Nigerian nationalist triad. And we took the subject from this book, this popular book by Professor Tony Falola and Dr. Bola Dauda, a classical work on the decolonization of Nigeria. It is a book I am recommending to you. In this analysis, we will go very deep in unraveling the issues and persons behind the Nigeria of today. So one of the authors of the book, Dr. Dauda, is my guest. Dr. Dauda, let me read from page 326 okay. of the book. You said, the central characters that we hear call the nationalist tribe Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, Chief Obafemi Awolo, and Sir Madu Belo set the rules of the late colonial era's political game. What do you mean by set the rules? <laughs> yes, set the rule, depending on where they were coming from. Uh, Sir Madu Belo knew how far behind they were well, the North was to compete with the rest of Nigeria, but also knew that they had the number. Don't forget, as far back as 1933 census, they have always put the North as 54, 55% of the population. Do you agree with that number? Ah, you are putting me on the spot to <laughs> you, you are, say... You are a researcher. Because if you look at Mali, yes, Mali's landmass <laughs> is even bigger than Nigeria. Yes, but the population is around 11, 12 million. Thank you. The more reason why you want to question. Yes, and this is where the British politics, the way they have already arranged things, you can imagine today that it's not possible for you to become the president of Nigeria without campaigning throughout Nigeria. For but, votes. But that should be the right thing. But the time we are talking about, the North knew they could control and win the election without even coming anywhere below Ilori or below uh, Makudi in the, on the other side. Yes, I would have went to the North, but I hardly read anything about Amadou Bello coming. There was no need to, because he could have the majority without coming. To the south. So do you believe in that population figure that the colonial It was impossible government... to have that population figure the, 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 the way it is. I traveled a lot around Nigeria, uh, you know, long before. Uh, we are talking of 60s, 70s, you know. You travel from um, Geba to Kotangura, from Kotangura to Kaduna, and you could hardly see any city along the way. There's nowhere you can travel 30 miles in the south or in, in the east without meeting a very large settlement of people. So where did they get the figures from? And they still retained the figures? They retained it. Even as far back as, or as recently as the new constitution that we had, still put 
19 states in the north against 17 or so in the south. Okay, you have raised a fundamental point. The population of the north is a suspect. I would say so. So these men set the rules. Yes. Of the game. Yes. The political game. Yes. How did they set the rules? Okay, take for example, election for example. You want to conduct the election and the North says we don't want women to vote and yet they they still could win the election. They could still control the federal uh, parliament. They were using teachers and so on as electoral officers, and they were also contacting the election. The, the, that is why it was possible to say that, okay, when the uh, motion was uh, taken by Enahoro for independence, and in, for 1953 or so, and did not say that they weren't ready. The British, in the end, settled that, okay, West, you could have your independence, and they had it in 1956 or 57, and the East, too. And it was only at the time of the general uh, independence that the North became independent. So that was setting the rule. They were ruling according to their own principles and beliefs. And Awolowo and Azikiwe could not counter them? That is where Nigerian politics becomes interesting because Awolowo grew up or was studying in UK in the 1940s when the North and the South actually had the constitution in 1946 that brought us together. Before then, North and South were ruled def separately. You are talking about the Richards Constitution. Yes, 1946. So, and at that time, Britain introduced national health, started their education, and so many other policies. So, Awolowo learned how to run the British parliamentary system while he was on ground. Asikwe grew up in the East. Or, or at least studied in the East, uh, in, in the mm. USA, mm. where they have presidential system. And you don't need to be a, a part of the House. You don't need to win a, a seat in the, in, the, in the parliament to become a minister if you are in the United States of America. And as a result of that, when Awol, uh, Azikwe lost in Lagos and the West, he, had, he was no longer a member of the parliament in Lagos. And that's when he went back to the East yeah. to depose Professor Ayo. So you have a situation in which the, where they grew up, their politics, their beliefs, and so on, affected the way they ran the system. You said they set the rules of the late colonial era's political game. Yes. With the death of Herbert Macaulay in 1946, yes. no other Nigerian leader competed with the triad as the founding fathers of the pre-independent Nigeria. Yes. So you agree they are the founding fathers? There's no doubt about that, uh, apart from Macaulay. You know, so. But today we hardly talk about Macaulay. Yes. Why? This is part of... Uh, a situation in which if you had a system and you don't think of succession, who is going to take over from you, you know, or if the people who took over from you they have an uh, unrealistic approach to running, Professor, or I would rather call him Professor Asikue, you know, Asikue was a philosopher. And being a philosopher or be, um, a doctor of uh, political science doesn't make you a politician. He wasn't a politician. And that's why he could not carry on Macaulay's uh, uh, agenda. But he was part of the NCNC. Yes. Macaulay was the leader of the NCNC. Yes. When Macaulay died, yes. Azikiwe took the leadership of yes. NCNC. Yes. So he carried on. 
he, he carried on in name. You don't forget that the Sikhist movement mm -hmm. named after him. They were rounded up. They were being tried. Asikwe did not even appear in court. Asikwe will have become the first president or prime minister of Nigeria, just like uh, uh, his uh, colleague in Ghana, Nkrumah. Nkrumah. But Asikwe refused to make himself available to go to jail. Now that you have come to this point, let's read the book. You said social science basic theoretical principles are critical to broadening the scope of understanding Nigerian politics. For an autocratic hereditary dynasty, a feudal aristocracy, or an imperial regime to voluntarily relinquish its authority runs counter to the natural laws of power and self-preservation. Therefore, it is a delusion to expect that the transition of colonized Nigeria with many ethnic primordial nationalities into a modern democratic nation-state within the hoisting of the independent Nigerian flag. Interpret this part before we move on. <laughs> you see, Nigeria was like France. When France started, it said, look, we have now France. And the same thing in Italy. We now need to bring the French and the Italian. So in the process, they made conscious efforts to make it possible. So in the case of Nigeria, that we didn't have the people who were ready to do that. Mm. So what we had were um, local leaders or regional leaders that we didn't have national patriotic leaders. You know, the point you make here is that Britain handing over to the local leaders did not mean that Britain had stepped out of the scene. Is that not? That's part of it. You said, but since the concept of civilizing the so-called natives was synonymous with modernization, independence would translate into modernity. Before we go further, so they were interested. They handed over, not because they wanted to, mm. but because by the end of the Second World War, Britain was bankrupt. So, they so if if Nigerians, Nigerian leaders, if they had access to the secret documents, the, the confidential documents regarding the the readiness of Britain to hand over, it, it would have been a different story. Britain handed over because Britain could no longer finance its colonies after the Second World War. So can we also say that Britain preferred the northern region? to control the system so that it will still have a hand on the system. It will do. It will also create crisis because they knew that the political leaders from the north did not have enough resources to bring the over 240 of ethnic groups in Nigeria together. But they handed over to the they north. They handed over because they know that that way they will... Uh, still be there by proxy. So they were there by proxy through the look, north. Look at it this way. In the three, four days of darkness after the second coup in 1966, go on. The initial plan was for the north to break. It was the British government or British people that advised go on that, look, you want to stuff your, you want to cut your throat by breaking away. There's no way you can survive without the resources from the South. But why do we make it feel as if the North cannot survive without the South? There are resources in the North. There are minerals in the North. There are. And the greatest resource for survival is human resource. Educated. Yes. Buhari is from the North. Yeah. Babangida from the North. Yeah. They have professors. 
So why do we feel the North cannot survive without the South? It's not a matter of something in Niger, Mali, and so on. It's if you allow people to rule themselves, they will survive. But by already bringing the North and the South together, you have already created a problem. We're talking of survival. In, this, in, 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 the, in the South today, go and interview any Yoruba or Igbo person. They don't believe that they can leave the education of their children to the government. Yes, they ask for government support and so on, but parents will take care of the education of their children in the South. To bring, to have allowed the North for 40, 50 years not to educate the people, if you are going to run the North with the people who can write in Arabic, you know, then they will run, they will survive. If they are going to so run the North with Hausa language, they will survive. But you want them to compete with the South in English, <laughs> with their certificates from the South. Look at what mess they made of our education today with federal character that allows someone whose scores, maybe we can hypothetically say 40, in Sokoto and get admission to Nigerian federal universities. And somebody who scored 80 in the South can't. They, they don't, it's not a matter of thinking they cannot survive. The issue is that they have not the institution, the, the framework for survival because the competition is with the South. No one says that Mali can't do, run. Mali is like northern Nigeria in terms of the desert, uh, the, the, pop the population and, and the uh, vegetation or the climate. Same with Niger. Niger. Who says they are not surviving? The issue is that you bring them together with the south and you now want to run the federal administration with university graduates. When I had my uh, youth call in 1974, Kano didn't have f enough people to go to the 12 states. Mm. All the graduates in, in, in 1974 from Kano could not give them 12 to post to 12 states in Nigeria then. And you want them to compete with this with the South in terms of employment in the federal. Yes. We are breaking down the point. This is an analysis of the Nigerian question through the personalities of Amadu Bello representing the North. Obafemi Awolowo representing the West, Namdi Azikiwe representing the East. In this analysis, issues are springing up. Lugard has been mentioned. And the analysis is based on the points raised in this classical work of power and politics, Decolonizing Nigeria, this book. And my guest is one of the authors. He wrote the book with Professor Tony Falola, Professor of History. You might agree with some points he has raised, and you might disagree, depending on the context. I hope one is allowed to disagree with you. Of course. That's what discussion is about. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that if you want to disagree with the facts, then you go and present your, uh, the facts as you know it. You know, I'm trying to take the book page by page. Even sometimes I'm tempted to move <laughs> to one page, but I'm trying to... That's why I, I keep taking you back. Yes, thank so you. So that we move from page... 
to page. Okay. You made a point about Azikiwe. Yes. I'm tempted to go there. Go on. But I'm saying, wait. I will <laughs> round off with it. Because okay. it is quite an interesting analysis of Namdi Azikiwe. Yes. So I will take it towards the end of the show. Okay. Let's go back to the definition of the triad. You said in their place as founding fathers, Nigeria as a nation was putty in their hands. Oh. These three men set the agenda for the national politics. They molded the constitution. They formed the political parties. They established the values. They set up the constitutional institutions for sharing the values of power and the wealth of nation. And they dispensed both the rewards for conformity to the norms and the punishment for breaching the shared values and customs. Thus, each one's part in the Nigerian dream is that of the dreamer or visionary, and as such, they were the script writers. Was Amadu Belu a visionary? He has a vision of what North he wanted. What was his vision of the North? I wish he was alive so that he could tell us. But my own interpretation, or our interpretation of his vision, is that... Look at the NPC, Northern People's Party. So he represented Northern people, not Nigeria. Mm. And they didn't change the name. So you, don't, you can't say you have any NPC from South or East unless it's settled in the South from the North. So if you have Northern People's Party, that is, means your vision is for you to rule, to look after the interests of the North. Look at the vision of saying, for example, we will not employ people from the South because it will be more difficult to dismiss them. So they preferred expatriates. Amadou Bello preferred expatriates to people from the South to work in the North. He was not a nationalist. Well, if you say so. From what you have just explained. He was the leader of the Northern People's Congress. Yes. But refused to go to the center yes. as prime minister. Yes. This is, this is where it's difficult to use language. He's a nationalist. But he's not a Nigerian nationalist. He's a Northern Nigerian nationalist. So you can be... If you, if you say, for example, if you define a nation, you said you did so last week. Yes. Would you say that Nigeria is a nation? I was going to ask you, is Nigeria a nation? They said it's not, but we are trying to build it, to make it a nation, because it's most nations can be um, as a result of uh, deliberate efforts by the people who live in such an area. Is there no deliberate effort by Nigerians to make Nigeria a nation? They were all at the Lancaster constitutional debate yes. in London. Yes. Was, there not a, was that not a deliberate effort to yes. build Nigeria? It, it, don't forget what I said about Britain being bankrupt after the Second World War. If, for example, Britain decided in 1960 that we will give independence to three Nigerian states, Northern Nigeria, Eastern Nigeria, Western Nigeria. It could have stayed. Mm. Just as it was forced on it to have Pakistan and Bangladesh away from the old India. You know, during those discussions before independence, yes. Awolowo and Amadou Bello agreed that each of the region should have the right to say they want to break out. Yes. Azikiwe opposed it. Yes. And the British government supported Azikiwe. Yes. So in this case, like Awolowo, like Amadou Bello. Yes. Is it not? Yes. Awolowo was, was more Yoruba than Nigerian. Is it not? Well, Awolowo, yes, Yoruba, but Awolowo was a politician 
Asikwe was not a politician. No, who is a politician? And the one who plays politics. And Asikwe did not play politics? He didn't even understand what politics is about. But he almost defeated the action group in the Western region, you the think NCNC. So? You think so? Yes. Yeah. When they started uh, cross carpeting in the Western region House of Assembly? Yeah. Dr. Dauda, you forgot that? No, I didn't forget. Uh -huh. It's just that you, you, when you are a politician, uh -huh. if you are an American politician, you don't need a constituency. You only need to promote your personality and your leadership quality to then get followers who will vote for you. If you are a British politician, which I will never was, you need a constituency. And he believed that the only way he could have a constituency is to develop that constituency and stay in the West. Mm. In the case of Fahadzikwe, because he had no constituency, he went down to the East by his ethnic background to depose someone from the Call the Calabar Ogoja Rivers. Because he was forced to grab a, con a constituency. He, he was. Does that make him a politician? But, but, but he, was, he had a constituency in Lagos where he won under the NCNC, even where he won under the Nigerian Youth Movement. Yes. That was a constituency. That was a constituency, but it was not a sustainable constituency. So he later went back. He was forced to go the Nigerian way. The ethnic way. He was forced to do that. The ethnic way. So the point is that among the triad, yes, he was the true Nigerian. Oh dear, so you you are making a a, a sweeping general uh, conclusion. Correct me. Look at it this way: in 1942 or 41 or thereabout, when there was crisis with Awolowo support, uh, supporting that the. Um, uh, there was Odemo of Ishara. Yes, in the who, Nigerian Youth Movement. In the Nigerian Youth Movement. He was not Odemo yet. Mm -hmm. And there was crisis. Odemo wanted to support... Uh, it, it has to do with where uh, do you make the head office of the Jebu province? And Awolowo did not support Odemo. And as a result of that, there was the issue of someone from the Southeast. Ernest Ikoli. Ikoli. Yes. And I will all supported that. Yes. At the end of the day, Asikwe lost and said it was politics. But it wasn't. The Jebus in, the, in, the, in, 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 in Lagos supported Ikoli, mm. which was, who was not a Yoruba person. Yes. So, At that time... The action group had not been founded. No. At that time, the Egbe Omo Duduwa had not been founded. No. So Awolowo had not gone the Yoruba way at that time. They were still young. Yes. So at that time, they were playing nationalist politics. But as they grew older, yes. they decided to build constituencies. Yes. Awolowo went back to Yoruba land. Yes. As he could remain at the center. No. He, at that point in time, he said it was ethnic politics against him. He did not see that the Yorubas supported someone from the Southeast who was not a Yoruba person. Mm. Did he call it ethnic politics? Oh, yes. Oh, get deeper. Yes. <laughs> we'll get deeper. We'll get deeper. But again, as we get deeper, because here we are trying to lay the background to the personalities. We have not gone deeper yet. Dr. Dauda wants us to get deeper. But not yet. We have to lay the groundwork. Then we'll plunge in. So let me go back to the book. I need to read this to you. Okay. <coughs> I have talked about social science basic theoretical principles. Yes. The power is not just given. No. You need to take it. So the authors of the book continued saying... Also, the traditional hegemonies would resist modernization, either consciously or, or consciously, consciously yes. or both, and to unseat such hegemony without violence was beyond one individual, regardless of that person's ingenuity, charisma, 
and political acumen. Dr. Dauda, to unseat such hegemony without violence. Yes. Looking at the present Nigeria today, yes. do we have political hegemonies? Political hegemony? Yes. We are trying to build one. Nigeria is trying to build one. Is the top leaders of the political class not hegemon? To some extent, yes. Because here, you said to unseat such hegemony without violence was beyond one individual. Yes. Let's assume that Nigeria is already a hegemony. Okay. And then Nam Dikanu wants to unseat it. <laughs> and he has launched a violent uprising. Does yeah. that make sense? Um, hmm. He's going to find it difficult. Because the hegemony will fight back. They will fight back. Mm. Yesterday I was listening to channel interview of uh, is it Oyema, the owner of Airpiece, mm -hmm. who started a price war in the aviation. And the whole of the international hegemony mm. gang against him and they want to take airpiece air piece out of the market. Mm. That is the power of hegemony. Why? Because he came and betrayed the group. If he was ready to charge as much as five million, if I saw at a stage that it was 22 million or so, to, for first class on uh, on British Airways from Lagos to 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 London, so he came on and said, "Look, this is outrageous. We can do it for two two million." And then started the price war. Mm. They made it difficult for him to land on time at Gatwick, yeah. which belonged to a Nigerian. <laughs> for that matter. They made it difficult for him to have a place where he could check in. That is what hegemony is about. It's like wanting to fight corruption when the entire system is systemically corrupt. But the only way from the definition here, the only way to displace hegemony, especially political hegemony, is to go violent. Is it not? No, it's not. You, you can do it with violence, but you can do it without violence. Only it will be difficult uh, battle. The assumption, or the point I made about Nam De Kanu and violence in the Southeast, is an assumption. It's for political analysis. In the Southwest, there was Sondibu. His fight was to deal with the Fulani hegemony yes. represented yes. by Buhari. Yes. So we saw how the system Yes. went after him. Yes. Is that the point you are making? That's how powerful it can be. If you look at the present government, look at... You know, when uh, Tinumbu decided to choose a Muslim, they said he shot himself in the head, in the foot or whatever. Mm. And when he decided to go and take somebody who was not a Fulani as his running mate, that one was even more dangerous for his political career. That is where the game becomes interesting. Mm -hmm. You know that the whole idea of breaking the uh, PDP was as a result of not allowing in the Northerner to succeed Buhari. Mm. So, it, it's like corruption fighting back. Mm. You know, if you have a powerful group and you want to displace them, you need to be clever. You said to displace hegemony, it requires meeting a set of conditions. Yes. One, the mobilization of the masses yes. for support. Yes. So that can be a revolution. Yes. Well, you, at the extreme form, it's a revolution. But it, it can be a bloodless one. 
it can be a bloodless one. Yes. You said two, a well-organized, concerted, an orchestrated group alliance yes. or an aristocratic class. Yes. Can you break that down? Okay. Look at how Tinumbu did it. He went to Kano to campaign more than four or five times because he needed that 0.5 million, which is more than possibly all he could get in the Yoruba Southwest. But you doubt that population? No, it's not the doubting of population in a particular city. Okay. It is the whole population of the North right. that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. It's like the amount of fuel they said we were using before subsidy was removed. Mm. If you didn't doubt it, then why did the number come down so drastically as a result of removing the subsidy? Is it because we are no longer riding the car or because they are no longer uh, smuggling and so on? So there will be so many factors that accounted for it. Mm. But Kano has always been a large city right from the old car caravan uh, trade to Mecca, to the north. So Kano has always been a large city. Mm. So Tinubu went there? Went there because he needed the number. Mm. So that is part of orchestrating the number, the people, or system, or plans to make sure that the hegemony is broken. And you said number three, there's a need for the leadership of astute, diplomatic, and skillful politicians. Yes. Are you a politician? No. You don't play politics? No. What is politics? Politics? Yes. In, in political science, last word gave us the basic definition of politics. Who gets what, when, and how? in his book that was published in 1951 or thereabout. In that case, I'm a politician. Maybe. I don't know. I have not... Uh, uh, I can use this program to decide who gets what, when and how. Yes, you can. If that makes you a politician, then you are a politician. Okay. But who gets what means you need to tell us who listens to your program. That's all that you can go. You cannot tell us who becomes the next governor of uh, Edo State. So who can say that? The politician. Not the people? True, the, uh, well, in mobilizing the people. So the people can be politicians in deciding who gets what? Yes, but in politics, people have their say, not their way. So sometimes political definitions are complex. Of course. There's no definition that is simple. You said to displace a hegemony. Yes. There must be the financial sponsorship of well-to-do business people. Yes. Money is involved. Yes. So Stalin wouldn't have taken over power in the Soviet Union without money. You see, the way you want to bring in examples mm. uh, can make it difficult for... Because logic does not work well in human affairs. So logic simply means all short people are, are evil. Bollard is short, therefore he is a devil. Mm. You know. So who can say money is not involved in Stalin's position as well? Unless you study the Russian something, then that's when you can really tell how much of money is involved. By land he were robbing, they were robbing banks to get money. Of course, to, anything you can do. To break down the hegemony. Yeah. Like the boys in the Niger Delta are breaking through pipelines. One of their tactics. To get money. Yes. And the money they get, they use to fight the hegemony. Yes. They fight the Nigerian state. Yes. And they can confront the state. Yes. So they combine money violence, and sometimes astute leadership, is it not? <laughs> Don't forget that we are all blessed with evil and good. Mm -hmm. 
So it depends on how you want to use, you, you, can, you are using your brain in the work you do. If you look back into your career of how you got to where you are today, and you look back at all those people who served their NYC with you, then you will see the difference in what you brought in, what qualities allowed you to do what you are doing today. If you are not a leader, you will not can be a leader. Mm. You can't do what you are doing if you are not a leader. If you don't have a vision of what uh, audience should be. So people can do anything they want to do, but they need uh, some guidance from the people who are uh, using them. You said, although violent hegemonic transitions are associated more with interstate transactions than with domestic processes, the intra-ethnic conflicts and contradictions of Nigeria's multi-ethnic nationalism are important caveats to this. You said here, Saamadu Belo and Obafemi Awolo recognized the preceding conditions yes. and made plans to work around them. Yes. They deployed necessary tactics and strategies yes. to triumph over the obstacles constraining political advances yes. in Nigeria. You did not mention Zeke. No. Why? Because he wasn't a politician. But we have agreed I... he played politics. He played it. He decided who gets what. He removed the professor in the eastern region and took over. They're not, they're not politics. Uh, it's politics. But what's... It, it, will you say it was a democratic way? Will you w say that... Was Amadou Bello democratic? It doesn't have to be. He was a feudalist. He, yes. So yet he played politics and Azikiwe did not. Yes. Don't forget where you started that they understood the preceding, the prevailing circumstance and worked around it. Namdi Azikwe wanted to break that prevailing circumstances and redefine it. Okay. Yes. Yes. That was his vision. He had a vision of Nigeria. Good. Awolowo had a vision of the Yoruba state. Maybe. Amadu Bello had a vision of the North. Maybe. Azikwe had a broad vision, so he resisted any attempt for any of the regions to break away. Yes. So, is that not politics, Dr. Why Dauda? did he support the uh, Ujuku in the end? Why did he support Ujuku in the end? Yes, to break away from Nigeria. What do you think? No, you tell me. You are saying he has a vision of Nigeria. If he had a vision of Nigeria, he should die by that belief. He was not ready you, for you to achieve what you wanted, if you listen to uh, Mandela, he said he was ready to lay his life for the freedom of the South Africans. Asikwe was not ready to lay his life. You said, for example... He was not even ready to go to jail. Okay, you keep coming back to that, so let's read what you wrote. You said, however... Had Azikiwe been brave enough to identify himself with the Zikist movement in 1946, he might have changed the course of Nigerian nationalism. Yes. How? You have young people who believe so much in you and name their movement after you as their hero, and you are not there to support them. A missed opportunity, you say? Not only a missed opportunity, it, it wrote volumes or spoke volumes of his character as a leader. He said they were young people with youthful exuberance. You said had he known that the British government had secretly made a plan to execute its decolonization policy, Dr. Azikiwe might have ended up in jail for a few months, like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in his, like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, his Gold Coast contemporary. He might also have won the independence of Nigeria, 
And since he was in an unrivaled position from 1946 to 1952, he might have emerged as the head of a united Nigerian state. Yes. You said he was in an unrivaled position. Yes. There was nobody to... Don't forget, 1946 we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Amadou Belu has not been to as far down as Iloni. He has never traveled down to Iloni, to, not to even talk of Lagos, that he was supposed to come and rule. By this time, Azikiwe had gone to America, he had gone to Ghana. Yes. And by this time, he had established the West African pilot. I, 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 that by the time Makoli died, there was no one else. Don't forget, Awolo I, I was a student in 1945. He graduated, I think, in 1946. He was not in Nigeria. The whole country and Asikwe brought down the go British government during the general strike in 1945. He was that powerful. That the colonial government yeah. has to uh, uh, concede. That was the position Asikwe was in 1946. You said such a triumph would have availed him the opportunity to fully implement a unitary government with a stronger center. Yes. And perhaps both Ahmad Bello and Awolowo would have had no choice other than to follow his leadership. Yes. However, by his dodging and docking to save himself from jail at a critical time, Dr. Azikiwe missed his chance of being the triumphant hero or immortal martyr of Nigerian nationhood. Yes. <sighs> he missed it? He missed it. And when he had the second chance too, he missed it. What was the second, second After chance? After the election in 1959 that gave us the independence, Awolowo offered to him. They didn't have clear majority that he should bring AP, uh, AG, Action Group and NCNC together to form the government, that he will be uh, a finance minister and Asikwe will be the prime minister. Asikwe refused and decided to go with the North. Why did he do that? He was always thinking of, you know, how he could, um, I don't know, I would think that he was thinking of how to promote the Igbo interest. And is that not altruistic? Is that not? Uh, well, yes, it is for the Igbo, but not for the what he was supposed to stand for, which is one Nigeria. Mm. So you feel he was a coward? If you use that word, yes. And a bad one, too. But he was brilliant. Yes, he was a philosopher. Can a philosopher be a coward? Of course. I thought a philosopher is a deep thinker. And that doesn't make them um, a, a, um, a brave thinker. A uh, deep thinker is different from a, 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 a strong one. Awolowo was courageous. To some extent. In the sense that even when the chances were that, and he actually lost in 1956, because of his policy of uh, education in the West, he was ready to say, look, they said they, should, they have enough system in place to rig the election. I said, no, if they cannot win on policy, then they are not fit to be in, go in government. Asikwe didn't believe in that. He said, for example, at the end of his trial in 1963, it only took Chief Obafemi Awolowo only a few minutes to deliver, like Mark Antonio inciting the Romans to rise against Caesar's assassins in Shakespeare Julius Caesar, the prophetic speech that threw the Western region into chaos, making it ungovernable until his release from jail after the military coups in January and July 1966. 
Indeed, the breakdown of law and order in the Western region from 1962 and the Agbekoya revolts at the peak of the civil war in 1969, both were rooted in the commoners and peasants, in the commoners and peasants' violent reactions against blatant electoral rigging and the real or perceived injustice in the treason trial of their esteemed and heroic chief Awolo. Likewise, the assassination of Belo and Balewa during the January 1966 school evoked popular revulsion from northerners against the Igbo specified by Chukuma Kandunan Zogu, the leader of the coup. So the point you make is that in his fight against imperialism and racial discrimination, Azikiwe as the voice of the oppressed colonial subject was acknowledged as a nationalist hero because of his courageous use of the media to blast colonial machinery. Now, Awolowo went to jail, but his charisma, his courage, triggered a revolt in the western region. Yes. Amadu Belo and Tafawa Balewa were killed. Yes. Their deaths triggered a crisis, a revolt in the north yes. that led to the pogrom. Yes. So, they were courageous, you agree. But you have said Azikiwe is courageous. He used the media to fight the colonialists. Yes. Courageous. Yes. Courageous. In a different context. He brought, he, he had the colonialists to ransom. Yes. Courageous. Yes. He even had Awolowo to ransom in the Western region with his paper. Courageous. Yes. How is Azikiwe not courageous? As I told you all along, I keep on saying mm. how we run into conclusion from a wrong premise. When you are talking of using the media or writing in the paper, Asikwe was brilliant. And don't forget the role of the media in Nigerian politics. You know that Asikwe, Awolowo, Akintola, they were, and you know, uh, Odemo, and so many others were all journalists in their days. Yes. So, as a result of that, they knew the power of information and they use it. But when it comes to politics, when it comes to uh, having a plan of how you want to govern the people, Asikwe was a philosopher. Was Awolowo a philosopher? Not really, but he was ready to learn. But from his he work, was, from his book that I read, I see a man who philosophized yes, consistently. but also a politician. A politician can be a philosopher. Yes. Okay. In fact, I define Awu as a philosopher. Yes, you, you know, will, it, will be right. You know his statement in court before he was sentenced. Yes. That was a philosophical statement. Of course. He saw the future. Yes. He predicted it. Yes. That is philosophy. Yes. That's okay. But to now know how you bring that into reality, into practice, Asikwe was uh, wanting. Okay. Let's, let, let's take some comments. Let's take some comments. Frank O'Day on YouTube is saying, Edmund is making my season. I've been listening to all State Affairs podcasts. Thank you. Perhaps Dr. Dauda is making your season because he's the lecturer here. I'm just playing the advocate, asking the question like the student. Frank O'Day says the greatest mistake of southern Nigeria was the inability of the sage and Zeke of Africa to work together. Do you agree? Of course. That's when I, why I said he, uh, Asikwe missed the second opportunity of forming the government in 1960. But that would have excluded the North. It wouldn't. 
they would still have no choice than to play along. Because the South would have totally dominated the North. Well, you are talking of domination. You are not talking of governance. Because uh, in, in my research, I also discovered that Azikiwe was advised, even if you read Billy Dudley. Yes. Billy Dudley he felt... Was, he was my external examiner for my first degree. Okay. He felt that to unify the country, there was a need for a southern and northern coalition, not south-south coalition. Yes. That was to keep Nigeria one. Yes. And Azik, that's what Azikiwe wanted, keeping Nigeria one. Yes. So it, the North would have been excluded from the government at independence. Which would have solved the problem permanently. How? Because even Tafawa Balewa believed that 1914 amalgamation was a mistake in 1951. So it, it might, you may look at it in terms of bringing Nigeria one, but it, it, it would have, maybe they would have left the rest of Nigeria. Peacefully. So we wouldn't have fought a civil war? There wouldn't have been a civil war. If they decided to go and it was agreed, then end of the story. Just like Pakistan left India. Just like Bangladesh left Pakistan. And do you think Yoruba and Igbo Just would... as, as recent as maybe four or five years ago, we have... Southern and Northern uh, Camera, uh, Uganda, or is Sudan. Sudan. The issue is that the way Nigeria was uh, brought together and governed for 50 years made it impossible, almost impossible, to have one Nigeria. But we have one Nigeria. Is we are working towards it. It's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. Not, it's not one yet? They are trying to make it one. Is it not one? On the There's day, one Nigeria. Yes, there is one. I don't want to end up in jail from here. Uh. <laughs> but the issue is that if it is... Okay, look at it this way. Why did Gowon release Awolowo and made him the prime minister of his government? Why? To keep Nigeria one. Hmm. But at that time, he had no option. He needed an Awolo. Huh. <laughs> he needed the brain of an Awolo. He needed the Southwest as well. Because the whole crisis that led to the uh, coup was that the West became ungovernable when Awolo was in jail. Mm. And Tafawa Balewa could not handle it. Wow. Femi Labi, I can see your message here. You said it's another day to be opened up. Okuru Donchuks. Okay, Donchuks, um, we can pick some calls. Let's take some calls before we round off. I will open the line. Okay, I can see your statements here. If you have question for Dr. Dauda, this is part one of the discourse because we've not even gone into the Social background and values and beliefs of Obafemi Awolo. That one is on page 329. We've not examined the different psychological makeup of the triads. We will examine in details. In details. We've not looked at the different personalities and political leadership styles of Azikiwe Awolo, although we've mentioned it as part of the background. So we are discussing chapter 9 of the book Decolonizing Nigeria. A great book. You know, at the moment, you can't find this book on Udara Books because we sold this book out about four years ago. But luckily, we just got some copies. Few copies. Few copies. We just got few copies of the book. We've not discussed regionalism, and the making of the Nigerian nationalist triad. We've not discussed that. So we'll discuss that in the course of the lecture. We'll have part two coming up soon. So the lines are open, or the line is open. Call 080 999 1849. 
Don Chooks, I want to hear from you. Don't call the other number, Don Chooks. Call the number on the screen, 080-399-18449. That's the number to call, WhatsApp calls only. So call the number, let's hear from you. Let's get your perspective of the subject before us. We are looking at the Nigerian Nationalist Triad and we are discussing the book Decolonizing Nigeria 1945 to 1960. That's the book. Hardcover. We just got about 10 copies. And those 10 copies came out from the archives. And after that, Dr. Dauda, this book is out of print. Yes. It's has become so scarce. Are you not thinking of reprinting? I know it will be so expensive to reprint now because the quality of the print is just super. It's a quality print. The binding is first class. Yeah. It wasn't printed in Nigeria. No, it was done in the U.S. It's such a quality print. I love the print. Yeah. You know, what does it take to write a book? Uh, a pen or a computer or what processor uh -huh. and uh, you sit down. And if you are like me, you tie yourself to the seat, mm -hmm. and then you write. And you write. But you must read to write well. We have a caller here. Okay, we have a caller. What does it take to write a book? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear Good you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Am I on to the radio man? Yes, you are on to the radio man. Oh, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm really enjoying your program, uh, and I thank you for educating the public. I'm quite sure that uh, this is exactly what Nigeria really needs at the moment. Uh, just like uh, you, you used to usually say on your program, we actually need to know where we are coming from. Because if we know where we are coming from, then we'll be able to determine what the future is. But my own opinion, from what I've been listening and from my own little research, is that I believe that Nigeria was built on a faulty foundation. And even the good book, the Bible, says, and what can a righteous man do if the foundation is faulty? We can see, I can deduce from all this uh, conversation that uh, Nigeria was built based on ethnic incompatibilities, right from foundation. So for me, I think, I think for me, my own strong opinion is that uh, every, every, all the nations that we have amalgamated together, we need to do something about it and everybody back to your tent. The reason is that uh, for progress and for peace, because Nigeria is in a situation whereby one area is dragging the other one to the south, the other one is dragging the other one to the east. So there is no unity, and if there is no unity among us, what can we do? So look at Nigeria, the way Nigeria is today. Before you can make any appointment for, for any politics, for any, uh, for, for example, to appoint a minister, every, every region has to bring, or every tribe, you have to put into consideration of ethnic sentiment. So Nigeria is not really built on marriage. So how are we going to progress with that? Thank we you. are not progressing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. We will still take some calls. Call in now because we are about rounding off part one of this discourse. Dr. Dauda, do you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, the gentleman there is worried that we, how do we move on? We move on if we are ready to do what is required. You mentioned merit. Okay. We... Have, uh, okay, Dr. Dauda, you, you will round off with what we need to do. Yeah. Let's take this call. Hello? Hello? Yes, good afternoon from Nigeria. Hello, good afternoon, Radio Man. I, I greet Okoro you. Okoro Donchuk speaking. All right, Okoro Donchuk. All right, the ball is in your court. Dr. Bola Dauda. Good afternoon and uh, good afternoon. Happy Salah. Yes, sir. I see. I've been listening to the program from 12 o'clock to now. Um, sir, we do respect, sir. As an elder, 
as a doctor in education, I believe uh, uh, as an old man in general, I believe you stand too tall to speak the truth and write the truth for future reference. You see, like you said some minutes ago, you don't want to end up in jail if you say what is in your mind. That was how Zeke, like you said, Zeke, like you always keep emphasizing that Zeke is not a leader, trying to bring him down. That is the same thing that we are doing at this present Nigeria. When somebody is trying to stand tall, we try to bring him down with ethnicity. And that is why Nigeria cannot move forward. If the eastern region, no matter how you break them into pieces, and the current western region can come together, I believe the northern Nigeria is going nowhere or have no basis to say we are more populated than or we have the right or monopoly to dictate who become the president. It's just that the eastern region and the western region they, that are already in the southern part of Nigeria don't look at each other eyeball to eyeball in terms of politics. We that are here in the UK, if you see the segregation between an Igbo man and, as, as a Yoru, and a Yoruba man, you'll be asking yourself, are we from the same country? Nigeria is built on lies, deceit, and we, are, we don't want to believe that this is a country that is making, like you said, we are still forcing ourselves. Like Edmund will say, is Nnamdi Kalo trying to redefine Nigeria? And systematically, you ignore that question. Is Sondo Iboho trying to fight the Fulanese or uh, uh, Fulani monarchy or hegemony? You systematically withdraw yourself from those questions. I believe that, I think that it is time that any person that is an author in Nigeria or a writer or a publisher, whenever you are writing, write like today is the last day of my life. Whatever that happens tomorrow, good luck. So that people that are taking over, look at, uh, we now learn, look at how we mess up education in Nigeria. That my son have to score 150 in common entrance to compete with somebody, then somebody from the north have to score 30 to be in the same class. And at the end of the day, the same person that scored 30 will become permanent sec, uh, Pam sec, minister of works. Then the, the, the other person that is brilliant will become secretary. How does the nation pro progress like that? All right. That we go and borrow, take loan from China to build a railway from Nigeria to the jail that produces nothing, while uh, uh, some places like Onicha that are producing goods and manufacturing all manner of uh, 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 products are there. All right. And nobody is talking about it. Thank we you. We need to be, uh, sir, please, with due respect, I am enjoying your program and I, I pray that God should give grace to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Don Chooks. Don Chooks. Okay. Dr. Dauda, it's time to respond. You know, he kept calling on you. So, respond to his point. Yes. Well, the book we wrote, we wrote it um, as an academic analysis of Nigerian politics and history and power and personality. Um, the way you are looking at it is as if, you know, I'm bringing down the Dr. Azikwe. I'm not bringing him down. And I didn't dodge the question about Kalu and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what I'm saying, and if you go on Amazon or so, you can get my book on uh, representative bureaucracy in which I dealt with federal character in Nigeria in two volumes. So the issue of merit is an issue. And if you read some of my articles too, in one of them I said what Nigeria needs is a system like it happened in America in which Obama worked in Chicago for three years. And from there, he didn't come from Chicago. 
He was not actually born in mainland U.S., but became a member of House of Rep. Became from there became a senator, and from there became the president. And his constituency remained where he worked for only three years. Mm. You know, so I have people who were born in Nigeria, in uh, Western Nigeria, but came from either other part of the country and has never visited. And you still want their local government for them to be recognized as uh, a Nigerian and for them to uh, get position. I've uh, written extensively. Actually, my doctorate was on federal character. So when you are talking of merit, the whole problem is that they adopted uh, positive action in, in, in a wrong way in Nigeria with the federal character. So the federal character in America is the way if you have two people who competed and they equally got the same uh, quality to get the job and it's a woman, then you can use positive action mm -hmm. to give the job to the woman or to give it to somebody from a lower uh, represented area. So I never, when I mentioned the issue of uh, not wanting to end up in jail, you will see that if you listen carefully, mm. the question was such that I could be taken as promoting uh, secession or yeah. so. That is why I said I didn't want to end up in jail because the yes or no or so that was put before me. But in terms of the uh, position we took on Asikwe as a politician, he brought in American politics into a British colony, and it didn't work. So you can see today we went now to adopt American presidential system. That's why it's possible to impeach the, uh, the uh, deputy governor in uh, Edo without any... Uh, end of the world for Nigeria. The issue was about to impeach Akitola in the West that led to the whole crisis in 1962. But that was triggered by the conspiracy of the North. Mm -hmm. Normally that impeachment would have gone with This ease. is what I mean by the second chance for Asikwe mm -hmm. when Awolowo offered him to be the Prime Minister in a coalition government and he would be the uh, a minister under him. So but remember, remember in 1964, after the federal election, by this time, Azikiwe refused to call on Balewa to form a government because the election was rigged. Yes. But according to all the famous analysis, the army did not back Azikiwe. If the army had backed Azikiwe, that would have been the end of Balewa because Azikiwe was not going to call on him to yes. form a government. Yes. But if, if, if research is anything to go by, the head of the army ever at that time, a British officer, took the side of Balewa, Azikiwe was placed under house arrest, and he was forced to call on Balewa to form a government. Dr. Dauda, at that same time, the NCNC had gone into alliance with the Action Group to form the United All Progressive Grand Alliance. Yes. OBGA. Yes. That was a chance for the Igbo and the Yoruba to come together. And they came together in 1964. Yes. If not for the 1966 coup, perhaps that was the coalition everyone was waiting for. Yes. And if you, re if you recall... That, that the 1966 coup, up to now, there is no way you can justify that the uh, coup did not kill people in the East. Opera was to be killed. There were so many other people on the list. Munrosi uh, uh, also. How did it happen that the Igbo who led the coup was not able to execute it within his own ethnic group? No one could explain that, and no one could get that out of the pain mm. that the people in the north felt when they saw the person they respected by the tree uh, or in a shallow grave. Okay, okay. 
Yes, we will leave it at this. Thank you. Because we will continue. This is part one. We are stopping here. It is a deep research. You, as the viewer, the listener, go and prepare for part two. Dr. Dawood, are we doing part two on Friday? Yes, we will. Yes, on Friday, it's part two. Then we will go deeper, deeper. We will go deeper into the subject. That is on Friday at 2 p.m. This is another book by Dr. Dauda. Life Begins at 70. I'll call this an autobiography. Is it not? Okay. It is. And it's also inspirational. Yes. You know, I love this book, Dr. Dauda. Thank you. You know, when I read it the second time, I've read it once, and I kept it since then. But recently I picked it up. I said, no, I can I read a book once, a book written by a scholar. You read it again and again. I felt the book. You talked about leadership, how to take care of one's health. Beautiful book. Thank you. You love the book? Yes. Why do you love your book? Uh, well, um, I wrote it to mark my 70th and um, men don't live long in my family uh, line. So I'm the oldest or the one that lived longest. So I thought I could leave a legacy for people mm. to learn on how to live their life. But the book um, is, is a lesson on, I wish I read it or wrote, knew about it when I was 30. Yeah. Maybe my life would have been different. You know, it is the book is the manual for building a successful life and the Godfather's confessional memoir. You know, we just got some copies of this book. It's also scarce. But luckily, Dr. Dauda brought some copies. So you will find this book. You can get it from us, Udara Books. But it's not on udarabooks.com yet. But before, by Sunday... This book will be on the store. But if you so need it now, you can contact us on our WhatsApp numbers. Our numbers are on the screen. And you would get your copy. This is a good book to read. Also check our stores. You know, there are book focuses on books, on politics, history, and power. We have more than 400 titles on the store, and we are collecting more. So go on the store, you know, take your time, and read the books, the descriptions, rather. Then get your copies, and we will send it to you anywhere in Nigeria. Udara Books is State Affairs, and State Affairs and Udara Books are under Bificom Media and System. So Bificom Media and System is the mother company. And that Bificom is powering the studio, powering Udara Books. So get your books on udarabooks.com. Dr. Dauda. Thank you. Thank you for featuring on State Affairs. Thank you. And thank you for, for being our lecturer today. <laughs> thank you. You will continue the lecture on Friday at 2 p.m. West African time. We'll be back. Thank you for being there. Thank I am Edmund Obilo. Thank you.